Well, thank you all very much. Um, Christoph has this amazing quality of being able to disarm anyone out of their nervousness um, with his, his good humor and his incredibly generous introductions. Um, I do thank you, Christoph, for uh, your introduction, for outing me as um, someone who doesn't know much about the world outside of St. Francis the Sissy. Um, I do know him as St. Francis of Assisi now, which is good. Um, I'd also like to thank the RCC staff, the student interns. You all are fantastic. It's such a pleasure to be here and to be working with you. Um, it's, it's a real honor. So because I have limited time, and I could actually talk for hours about this, I will get going on my talk here. Um, Aziz asked me today why I don't have euros on the pig, on my capitalist pig, and uh, it's largely because it was the Americans, the U.S. Americans, who were behind much of the, the work here. So I realized that I, I could have been a, list, a little bit more um, culturally sensitive here and put the euro symbol on there, but <laughs> anyway, I'm going to be talking about Americans. So my talk today is um, one part of a larger project and it's tentatively called Conflict in the Land of Morning Calm, an Environmental History of 20th Century Korea. And see, I did it. That's not the right slide. This little thing is a real challenge to use. Okay, so that um, says Komsugangsan, and that is Land of the Morning Calm. That is what Koreans see as the, um, the phrase that best uh, defines Korea, um, and so that's the, the name I've chosen for my larger project. At the center of that project is the 1950 to 1953 war with an eye toward the environmental consequences of that conflict. Determining how the war transformed the landscape, of course, requires me to look both forward and backward. And um, so my project begins with the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 to 1905 <coughs> and ends sometime in the late 20th century. I haven't quite determined what the end point will be. Today, however, I'll focus on South Korea's post-colonial development from the peninsula's liberation from Japan in 1945 until about 1961, when Park Chung-hee staged a military coup, installed himself as the head of a ruling junta, and set into motion a very different stage in South Korea's economic development. It was in the 15 years or so between the end of World War II and the beginning of Park's administration that various international agencies in cooperation with and at the behest of the South Korean government engaged in remaking that nation's ecology in order to remake its economy. So under the aegis of organizations such as the United Nations Korean Reconstruction Agency, or UNCRA for short, and the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, South Korea adopted the techniques, technologies, and tenets of capitalism in order to establish itself as a partner in the regional and global economy. Central to this process, I argue, were pigs and goats, seeds and trees, and the principles of scientific resource management. So I want to provide as much context as I can in as little time as I can, so I'll be moving very quickly through these next several slides, but I'm happy to talk about any of them, go back to them, um, and any part of my project uh, in the, the discussion period afterwards. So a quick note on the image at the right here. Uh, this is actually a map of the Korean Peninsula. Its imagery draws inspiration from another map developed in 1908 by the noted Korean historian Che nam Son, which he created in response to Japanese imperial cartography, which depicted Korea as a rabbit. Very different views of the peninsula, and Che was not terribly subtle here in his critique of the Japanese occupation. He tapped into Korea's folklore, where tigers are important figures representing strength and independence, and, some may suggest, foretold Korea's future as a powerful economic player in East Asia and beyond. So because that map is not terribly helpful in um, showing you the geography, I'll show you another one, which I think is much more easy to read, right? No? Okay. Well, this is... Um, a depiction, an artistic rendering of all of Korea's mountain ranges. One of the things, most important things to know about Korea is that it is mountainous. 70% of its terrain is mountains. 
So this first image here provides an artistic rendering, as I said, of Korea's extensive system of ranges, portrayed here as a plum tree with its roots up along the Yalu River um, on the border with the People's Republic of China and coming down um, along the Baekdu spine of uh, the Korean Peninsula. It is beautiful, but perhaps not as informative as this one here, which shows the same terrain. The highest point in the peninsula I have marked up here, it's Peik Dusan, and it's right there by the, uh, the end N there. And it is on the border with the PRC, and it comes in at 2,744 meters, so just over 9,000 feet. Not a terribly high mountain, not short, but not tall. Um, so, although not especially high in elevation, Korea's mountains are no gently sloping hills, as you can see in this image, taken on the top of Mount Paektu in April this past year, uh, which was one of several photo ops for North Korean fighter pilots who had had the opportunity to meet with Kim Jong-un, right there in the center. They all look very, very happy there, even though it also looks very, very cold. Um, so I emphasize Korea's mountain mountainous nature because it constrains land use options and, as we'll see, makes Korea's development, at least in the way it was undertaken in the period that I'm discussing, highly problematic. So topography, as important as it is, does not tell the entire story. So I'll show a few slides now to illustrate resource distribution across the peninsula. One caveat is that these images are based on data from 1972, so outside the period under consideration, but I think they still illustrate what the, the point is I'm trying to get across. So we'll start with the DPRK. Um, this is North Korean land use. On the left, you can see land utilization. This is depicting um, rice paddy farming, and that is in the, the dark orange color. The um, brownish color is dry land farming, barley, millet, wheat, that sort of thing. Green is forest land, and the, um, sort of the light brown is barren land or scrub land. The image on the right shows um, a, a variety of different industries that were present in North Korea in 1972. Um, notice that they are uh, very well um, present here on the western side of North Korea. So the DPRK constitutes approximately 55% of the peninsula's total area, but of that only one quarter is arable, just right along in here, as you can see. <coughs> In stark contrast is South Korea, the Republic of Korea, where uh, the majority of the peninsula's agricultural lands exist. And here you can see, again, the, um, the dark orange and the sort of the rusty yellow here. That is all agricultural land. The green is forest land and the brown are barren or scrub and um, brush lands. So for the moment, I'd like for you to imagine the two nations as a single country because that's what it was when my story really begins, with the end of the Second World War and the arrival of the United Nations. UN victory over Japan, which had claimed Korea as a colony beginning in 1911, promised a new era for the Korean Peninsula, including self-government and domestic economic growth fueled by natural resource development. Although its primary mission was to repatriate Japanese military and bureaucratic personnel, the UN took an early interest in Korea's economic recovery and development, sending agricultural and industry experts along with military advisors. These specialists, mainly from Europe and the United States, and some retained from the Japanese colonial administration, not well received by the Koreans themselves, of course, <laughs> conducted numerous studies of available natural resources and proposed plans for improving Korea's domestic production, in part to reboot the Korean economy and in part to support the UN's larger policy aims in the region, which was to support Japan's reconstruction and um, growth in economy. These studies and their recommendations reflected a belief on the part of the UN personnel that an industrialized capitalist economy based on extensive scientific use of well-managed natural resources would help establish democracy in Korea, thus enhancing economic and political stable, uh, stabilization regionally and globally. These plans assumed a unified Korea, but as we all know, there are two Koreas. 
as the maps I've shown suggest, division of the peninsula was highly problematic. You can see again that most of the arable land is here. Most of the minerals and industrial resources are here. So even beyond the obvious social and political reasons, this had implications for development. Division occurred in 1945 when the United Nations established two administrative zones, one in the north, headed by the Soviet Union, and one in the south, led primarily by the United States. The division which was intended to be temporary, but it became permanent with the election of two governments in 1948, one in the north, one in the south. With that political divide, which became reified on the landscape by the war, the DPRK's ability to grow sufficient food was greatly diminished, and the Republic of Korea lost nearly all access to mineral and industrial resources, including the ability to heat and power to generate heat and power domestically from anything but wood-based products. So you can see where I am going here. This is a very difficult position for the Koreans and the Korean Peninsula to be in. The war is, of course, an important part of my project, but I'm not going to talk too much about it today because I want to talk more about um, pigs. I know you came to hear about livestock, not about bombs, um, but I would like to show a few maps to show the general trajectory of the military operations, um, as well as a few wartime images to illustrate the most striking environmental consequences of the war. Because I, I would argue, and I'm not alone in that, that the conflict foundationally shaped the ways international agencies approached reconstruction and economic development in South Korea. So I will go through these fairly quickly. They are just to demonstrate that the war affected every aspect of the peninsula. The, map on the left is the initial uh, invasion of Republic of Korea territory by the DPRK, the first capture of Seoul. Less, uh, just over one month later, the North Korean forces had pushed the Republic of Korea forces down to what is called the Pusan perimeter here. And it was at that moment that the United Nations became involved in this um, originally internal conflict. So. The left-hand image here shows uh, MacArthur's brilliant plan to move UN forces behind the lines of North Korea to distract them from the Pusan perimeter and get them engaged farther up on the peninsula. And that is in fact what happened and the United Nations actually pushed into North Korea all the way to and beyond um, the border, the Yalu River border with the People's Republic of China. That brings in the People's Volunteer Army from China, which then pushes the UN forces back down the peninsula. The North Koreans and the PVA um, capture Seoul again, and that then pushes the, um, the Republic of Korea and UN forces, which now incorporate 17 nations, including Colombia, Turkey, um, Australia, and Great Britain and Canada. Um, I think I've got pretty much everyone here who's in the audience that um, had forces there. I tried to make sure I got that in there. Um, and it, it ends up in a massive stalemate for over two years. So my point in showing these maps is to demonstrate that this kind of military activity with major air um, bombing, carpet bombing, and artillery swept all the way across, north and south, east and west, throughout the entire peninsula. In fact, getting into mountainous areas that had been largely untouched or unexploited by the Korean peoples themselves. There is um, one recent study that placed the amount of forest cover reduction directly attributable to the war at upwards of 60%. So here is a plane dropping some bombs. Um, this is some of the smoke from that. And all of these little white marks here are craters from the artillery and the shelling. So massive, massive um, destruction of the forests. Here is um, some close-up shots. Bloody Ridge, a famous uh, battle site. Um, you can see the ridge line here. These are trench works reminiscent of World War I. Um, and this is both um, North Korean um, PVA forces and UN forces carved these into the ridges um, as part of their defensive works. But here is Old Baldy, so-called because the artillery had shorn it entirely of its forest and brush cover. And that led the um, UN soldiers to call it Old Baldy as though it had been shaved completely clean. <clears throat> 
And I'll leave this uh, image up for a little while. This is uh, an, um, a painting by Hugh Cabot, who was part of the United Nations Communication Division. He was charged with taking photographs and recording visually the effects of the war. And I think this is one of his most striking because it demonstrates, um, obviously, the humanitarian uh, effects of the war, as well as, I think, the um, environmental ones. So with destruction of the mountain forests came widespread erosion, siltation of rivers, and a host of associated problems, including disturbance to and loss of wildlife habitat, decrease in available uh, fuel sources, and of course, dislocation of millions of people. Agricultural areas were also affected, in part as a result of the destruction at higher elevations. The erosion would come down, silt over paddy fields, um, and of course uh, the rivers where they got their water for irrigation. And in part due to direct devastation of the fields, farms, and farm animals themselves. Thus, the agencies involved in Korea's development had a wide variety of humanitarian and environmental crises to manage, most of which they believed could be resolved through scientific resource management, an approach predicated on the assumption that science could overcome problems in nature, and in short order, that democracy and economic growth would follow. It is crucial, I think, to remember that the Korean War was the first so-called hot war of the Cold War, an ideological battle as much as it was a military conflict, one that pitted the tenets of capitalism against those of communism. Here in enter our capitalist pigs. So these, um, th these are two of the breeds that uh, were brought into Korea to improve the swine population. Um, these are enormous. I don't know if any of you are familiar with pigs, but these are pretty darn big pigs. They're much bigger, much fatter, much meatier than the native Korean pig, a picture of which I'll show you in just a little bit. So as I mentioned, uh, there were a number of international agencies working in South Korea, but for the sake of time, I will focus today on the work of, the, of UNCRA. Um, the UN General Assembly established UNCRA on December 1st, 1950 right when the war is getting going, and identified its purpose as twofold, stating in the agency's founding document, quote, the, the creation of a United Nations program of relief and rehabilitation in Korea is necessary both to the maintenance of lasting peace in the area and to the establishment of the economic foundations for the building of a unified and independent nation, end quote. To meet that mandate, UNCRA attempted to rationalize South Korea's natural resources and agricultural practices through scientific management in order to facilitate that nation's entry into regional and global markets. Their plans included replacing Korean species, plant and animal, wild and domesticated, with what they deemed to be better species, like these, imported from North America, Europe, Japan, Africa, and Central Asia. Sorry, Australia. The UN's first steps were to conduct studies of available resources that would form the basis of South Korea's economic recovery and transition. Most of these studies focused on reforestation and agricultural development, which were seen as mutually supportive of each other. Paul Zengraf, an American forester, headed a UN-sponsored working group on South Korean forests in early 1950, actually before the war began. He concluded that without immediate attention to reforestation, early catastrophe, and this is a quotation, early catastrophe is inevitable, and other recovery and reconstruction measures will have been in vain, end quote. The war increased his urgency for reforestation practices and um, policies because he believed that reforestation, if it was not undertaken, would impede every other uh, development practice in the region. He argued, or recommended, pardon me, that planting, the planting of fast-growing species such as red pine and acacia uh, on bare ground to mitigate erosion and to reestablish forest conditions in a quick manner, but urged that, quote, permanent and more valuable species, end quote, such as Japanese black larch be utilized uh, in, a, in the longer term. Robert Dupasquier, an agronomist hired by UNCRA in 1951, agreed with Zengraf. Quote, South Korea's life depends mostly on production from the soil. The recovery and development of agriculture and forestry have thus to be considered as the main aims in the, rehabilita <clears throat> excuse me, the rehabilitation plan of this country, end quote. <clears throat> 
So although de Pasquier saw reforestation as complementary to agricultural development, his primary concern was with improving the nation's crops and animals, both of which had been devastated by the war. He noted in his report that livestock numbers had decreased quote, in such a proportion that in many parts the tillage of the land is difficult and the supply of meat and eggs is greatly shortened, end quote. His recommendations included re-establishing research stations across the country, conducting soil and disease studies, and, again I quote him here, the introduction of foreign varieties on a large scale. So a year after Du Pasquier submitted his report, Ankara issued a press release about its efforts to improve South Korea's livestock situation. It noted, and here I quote them, the war in Korea had brought about unprecedented destruction of livestock that, and such that the importation of breed animals for rapid increase of livestock as well as to improve its quality is vital to the recovery of the country. So Korea's future rested on the back of animals like these. These sentiments echoed those of Kim Hong-kyu, a rice specialist and advisor to the UN Civilian Command, who made an impassioned plea for both replenished livestock herds and for support for Korean students to study agriculture and related subjects in the United States. Kim reported that the cattle population in Korea since uh, June 25th, between June 25th and December 31st, so within the first six months of war, the cattle population had decreased by 45%, Dairy cattle and horse numbers had declined by nearly a quarter. Hogs and poultry by almost 75%. Sheep and goats by half. Rabbits by 38%. And honeybees by 48%. Dire circumstances indeed. To address these deficiencies uh, raised in Dupasquier's report and affirmed by Kim's request and um, the UN reports, Ankara implemented the Heifer Project and the Improved Seed Imports Project. Thurl Metzger, a farmer and agronomist from the United States, led the Heifer Project, which you might know better today as Heifer International. Metzger worked with stock experts in the United States, Canada, and Japan to find suitable goats, pigs, and chickens to supplement South Korea's dwindling supplies. In August 1952, Metzger reported in a newsletter to his supporters that initial shipments of livestock to Korea were successful. And I'm quoting him here, these included 600 cases of hatching eggs, 297 purebred hogs. It was very important that the, the uh, livestock was purebred. Um, and 95 son and goats. Son and goats are from Switzerland. Many of you may know that. Each case of eggs, so 600 cases, each case of eggs contained 30 dozen. And if my math is correct, and if it's not, let me know later, um, equaled a dozen, a, a total of 18,000 dozen. That sounds like a lot of eggs. Maybe it's 1,800, but it seems like 18,000 to me. Um, that were sent from Korea to, uh, to Korea from American chicken breeders in a single year. The pigs and goats came from Des Moines, Iowa, and San Francisco, California. So here is the call for support to send goats to Korea from Heifer, uh, the Heifer Project. And I love this picture here, so I will show it to you as a close-up. There are these two little children obviously loving their new goats. And here is a picture of the Sanin goat in case you want to see them up close. That's as close as I will ever get to a Sanin goat. Although most of the animals arrived in good health, they were not exactly what the Koreans had expected. And some controversy arose, especially over the goats. So I'm guessing this was a photo op staged with happy children. The people really, the pe Korean people really were not excited about these goats. Um, nevertheless, the animals became a basis for new improved breeding stock in Korea, either to replace Korean breeds or to be interbred with them. And here is the Korean native. That's the, the breed name, the Korean native. Due to these programs in the 1950s and into the 1960s, this pig very nearly went extinct as a di uh, uh, distinct breed. I'll come back to that in just a moment. So while Young Unkra's immediate goal was to increase agricultural yields, both to make Korea self-sufficient and to pr uh, produce a surplus for external markets, a secondary aim was to modernize South Korean agricultural practices through the implementation of scientific research and introduction of new technologies. 
both the heifer and improved seed imports projects were experimental in nature and with the stated goals of determining which species or varieties would adapt best to quote climactic and other conditions in Korea. They implemented what was called climate analogs for both animals and for seeds to determine which of these species would best adapt to uh, Korea's uh, climate and weather and elevation and all of these things. Um, I won't go into that, but I'm happy to talk about the, the um, climate analog uh, idea in the discussion because I think I'm running close to time. So I'll skip to a few statistics. Uh, which I think are telling. According to May 1960, uh, a, a May 1960 report by the United States Overseas Mission, international reconstruction efforts showed promise. Agricultural production had improved with 1959 totals in grain production up by 11% from 1955 totals and by 19% over 1953 totals, attributed in part, um, the report reported, the report stated, <laughs> That was a little redundant. Um, to improved methods, importation of fertilizer, and extension of irrigation. Less than one year later, however, another U.S. mission report stated, quote, Korean agriculture is underdeveloped in the full sense of the term, end quote, with subpar yields of rice, barley, and even fruits and vegetables. This was due, according to this report, to failures in credit and marketing channels. That is, to an underdevelopment of capitalist institutions in the country. So while the pigs and the goats and the cows and the trees and the seeds had perhaps done their part, the capitalists had not. Korea's pigs weren't quite capitalist enough to sustain a vibrant economy. Indeed, South Korea's economy stagnated, falling behind North Korea's, which flourished through the 1960s and 1970s. And it was not until the 1980s when South Korea instituted more liberal <laughs> land reforms and broadened its markets, and I might add, brought back the Korean native pig, which is in full flourish right now, um, that the South Korean tiger began to roar. Thank you all very much. I look forward to your questions and comments. <laughs>